This seminar was filmed at the USPTA World Conference on Tennis. During his career as a player, Tom Gullickson won 16 top-level doubles titles, 10 of them with his identical twin brother, Tim Gullickson. His career high rankings were world's number 34 in singles and number 9 in doubles, both in 1984. After retiring from the professional tour in 1987, Gullickson became one of the original members of the USTA Player Development Program, coaching players such as Todd Martin, Jennifer Capriati, and Andy Roddy. He was the U.S. Davis Cup captain from 1994 to 1999, guiding the winning team in 1995. In 1996, Gullickson coached the U.S. Men's Olympic Tennis Team. Thank you. As you can see by the way these young guys are hitting, the old guys are really going to be challenged today. So we may have to split them up a little bit. What do you think? How many want to see these guys split up? Not yet. Not yet? You want to go the old guys against the young guys? Yeah, we got the power team against, you know, experience and wisdom. You heard of Jimmy Connors' quote about experience, right? He said, the only trouble with experience, by the time you get all this experience, you're too damn old to do anything with it. And that's kind of how I feel when I played out as well. But, uh, you know, thanks for getting up early this morning and coming out. I can see you've all got great tan, so you decided to sit in the shade. Yeah, nobody's working on their tan over here in the sun, which is probably a good thing. But uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about doubles today. You know, I know most of us play a lot of doubles now, and certainly in teaching, you know, at your clubs or parks or wherever you teach, college or whatever, you're, you know, you're playing, you're coaching a lot of doubles. You're really focused on doubles and how can we get our men and our women and our kids playing better doubles. And I just want to talk just quickly about kind of the composition of a doubles team. You know, I, you know, most people have a choice of who they play doubles with. Uh, my, my doubles partner was really determined more by genetics. You know, I had to play with my little brother, Tim, who was five minutes younger than me. And uh, we had a great run together and had a lot of fun playing doubles together. But, uh, you know, I always felt, and certainly when I was Davis Cup captain, when I, in, in trying to compose a team, I really liked to have one very consistent player, you know, particularly playing on the deuce court. Because when you look at the scoring system in tennis, most of the bigger points are really played on the ad court. And if you put the real steady, consistent returner on the deuce side, you know, you know and, and in Tim's case, he hardly ever missed a return. So he would give me a lot of love 15s and 1530s and 3040s. And if I could just cash in on one of those, you know, there's a good chance we could break serve. So I, I really always liked the composition of the deuce court player being really steady, really consistent. And then the ad court player maybe having a little more firepower, you know, maybe hitting a little bigger, and maybe even having a little more variety of shot. So on that, on that break point, you might be able to rip a forehand down the middle or throw up a nice topspin lob, you know, over the head. So that's kind of the composition I look for kind of tennis-wise. And then, you know, you'd love to have a team that had two great servers, you know, because then you could both hold serve, you know, fairly easy. But I think the worst doubles team is two kind of very average to below average servers playing together, because then you're really going to be struggling to hold serve all the time. So, you know, I like to see at least one really strong server where you, you know you're going to hold that guy's serve or that girl's serve pretty much every time. And then the other server maybe is an average server, you're going to have to struggle a little bit maybe to, to hold their serve, but at least you got one you know, absolute guarantee where this guy or this girl is going to hold serve 95% of the time. So that, that's kind of the composition I look for tennis-wise. And then, and then personality-wise, you know, there's always one person who's kind of the kind of team captain, if you will. And, uh, you know, one person maybe has a little more aggressive personality and, and they like to kind of take charge and, and kind of be the captain, the cheerleader, and, and really, you know, be the more aggressive personality. And then it's nice to have somebody on the team that's a little calmer, you know, kind of like a young Sam Query or a 20-year-old kid. He's pretty relaxed and laid back. And, and it's kind of good to have a combination in your doubles team where one guy's really intense and and, and really, really getting into it, and the other guy's kind of laid back, and, 
you know, that's, that's a good mix to have in your, in your doubles teams. So um, what I'd like to do, uh, just starting out with the tennis, I'd like to have the young guns over here, okay, on the receiving side. And what we're going to do, I'm actually, no, you're an old gun. Actually, I'm going to take your place, Jeff. And Louie, you're going to be my partner. What, what I'd like to do is just kind of go over the four positions on the doubles court and kind of the responsibilities and really try to, to break down each of the four positions in the doubles court and, and really go over those in detail. And then I'm going to get out of the, the playing part and uh, I'll do more of the announcing and the cheerleading part. I'll let Jeff get in here. So Louie, you're my partner. I'm going to be the server. Okay, a couple things, uh, you know, on the server. Obviously, positioning. And I learned a really great trip to, uh, tip, doubles tip from Fru McMillan, who was one of the great doubles players of all time. You know, typically, when we're coaching doubles, you know, I you know, I know Louie's a good player, and he's going to cover his half of the court, so I'm basically responsible for this half right now. And I might position myself halfway between the hash mark and the outside line. But if I hit this serve and Jonathan hits it straight back on the same line, it's pretty far from Louie, right? See all that distance between the ball and, and Louie? There's, there's quite a distance there. And one of the things that Fru McMillan told me, which I thought was great, was he said, sometimes in doubles, you know, you should serve a little more from the middle. That way, if I hit a really good serve and Jonathan hits it back more or less on the same line I hit to him, it's going to be a lot closer to Louie, and if he's awake, he can get it and put it away. Very nice. And uh, so that's one thing you may think of. And also, you know, most people that play the deuce court are right-handed, and what's their better shot usually, their forehand or backhand? Forehand. Is that a question or an answer? That's an answer. Okay. Forehand? Okay. So, you know, by serving more in the middle, you know, I get a much better angle to Jonathan's backhand so I can, you know, hit that hard slider down the tee and then he can hit it in the alley, which is good. <laughs> See, these young guys don't know they got to set me up. Yeah. They're supposed to set me up high ones, right to me, kind of one step, maybe two. Okay? So that's the first thing. You know, and I, obviously, if I get my first serve in, I'm never going to double fault. So. You know, I try, to, I try to get, you know, I don't go for the 100%. I don't go for the, you know, okay, Louie, I'm going to crank a big flat one like that. That's not my serve in doubles. I like to go for the 80 or 90% hard slice to give me some more time to get into that net and, 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 and join my partner at the net. So that's, and... Uh, I'm also going to cover the lob over my partner's head, too. Not that he can't cover his own lob, but one of the things is, OK, that's a good one. But if he gets a deeper lob, and that's one of the main reasons you always want to split. You see a lot of players playing doubles, and they're serving volley. They hit that serve, and they're running right through the split step. So I'm really committed to where I'm moving to. And when the lob does go over my partner's head, I'm moving this way. So I think one of the fundamental movement principles in tennis, really, singles and doubles, is always squaring up your shoulders and splitting before your opposition hits the ball. So if I come into the split step area here, right before Jonathan hits, I'm going to square up and split. And now I can react in any direction. If he does lob it over my partner's head from the split step, you know, I can go over here, and then we can play again. Yours. <laughs> so uh, those are basically. And then one of the kind of the more disturbing uh, things I saw at the US Open this year was watching my good friend Mark Knowles losing the quarters to two guys who served and stayed back. So I think we should, you know, certainly touch briefly on the serve and survey. You know, rather than serve and volley, 
the serve and survey play and stay back and pound the groundies, which, you know, and I think one of the reasons on the tour that you see some players playing, you know, serve and stay back now is really the, the quality of the ground strokes in the passing shots has totally overwhelmed the ability of, of, of the guys to volley and hit overheads and, and cover the net. So I don't think, I pers my personal opinion is that players aren't spending enough time really on the mid-court game and the front-court game. But let's just play a little rally here going cross-court. As you can see, I don't want to hit a backhand. Oh, then that'd be the poach there. So, you know, a good player like Jonathan with a big forehand, he can really, you know, use those angles and, and, and get off. But, you know, if you are staying back and you, you, know, you get a short one, get a short one, and then I can come in on an approach and uh, play it from there. Okay? So, if you do stay back, say Jonathan hits a short return, okay, if he can. Then I can hit that nice approach and then come in from there. So that's kind of the, the roles and, and responsibilities really of the server's position. And Louis, if you could serve some to the ad court here, we'll go over the server's partner. Okay. First thing on the server's partner that I see, especially at club level tennis and in league tennis, is these people stand too close to that. They're like here. And when Tim and I used to play against Yannick Noah in doubles, that's where he stood, but he was 6'4", and he had a 40-inch vertical leak. You know, so unless you are 6'4", with a 40-inch vertical leak, I wouldn't highly recommend standing here. And what I like to see for most players is kind of middle of the box, right in here. And that way, right before Brock would hit the return, I get my nice little split. And then when I poach, if I move across, I can cut the angle so much better. When I'm too close to the net, you know, there's really no way for me to move from there and cut off the angle. So, if Louie would just pop a little serve in there, and then I would uh, be able to cover that ball if it's down the middle. Just hit a return kind of over the net strap. Okay, we're not competing yet. There you go. So, you know, I'm all, you know that way, starting halfway back, and getting that nice little split in so you get up on your toes a bit. And then always, always cutting the angles. You know, always, you know, from here, leading with the racket all the time and then cutting that angle. It's really important when you're moving across in doubles to lead with that racket out in front of me. You know, a lot of players at the club level get what I call the big eyes and the big swing. You know, the ball's kind of sitting up, their eyes get big, and the racket goes way back here. Then they hit it against the USPTA sign back there. So I think when you're going across, you can hit another one kind of over the net strap here, nice and easy. Lead with the racket, so those hands are in front like that. Lead with that racket, and then everything's going to be out in front, OK? The other thing that the server's partner should do is really cover their own lobs. You know, even, you know, lob, lob one to me here. Yeah, I mean, that's a nice one. And even if I have to play a defensive shot, say he hits a good lob, even if I have to get back here and just tap it back deep. Here, just you know, give me a ball. Just give me a, a, a good lob here. Just hit a good lob over my head. You know, even if I had to go back and tap it, you know, and then uh, something like that, and then just keep that ball in front of us, then we're still on offense there. So even if you don't, aren't in position to really snap it off, if you can just tap it back deep and then get back up to the net, that would be great. And there's also something called kind of what I call space management. You know, and space management is really covering a certain part of the court, you know, as a server's partner with a little bit of aggression. When Tim and I played, I always made it my own personal goal to win at least two points in net form. I wanted to win two points a game as a server's partner to take pressure off the server. You know, and everybody moves differently and everybody has different abilities to volley, but I think the concept is 
you're starting here, and you want to be aggressive within the space that you can cover. Okay? And aggression really starts up in your thinking. Your thinking has got to be, I'm going to really be aggressive. I'm going to really try to help my partner out. And then hopefully that thought translates down to your feet, so your feet get excited. And then, you know, from there, you just attack that ball. So. Don't worry, I won't hit you, Donald. So, you know, that, and, and that way, and what I like to do, just personally, everybody's a little different, I like to look at this net strap right here as my guide, and any ball that Brock would hit that would come over the net on my side of this net strap, I, I really feel that's my ball. Okay, so any ball that's coming in here, another way to break that down is if Louie's coming in, just come in a second, if he's got a forehand volley more toward the middle of the court, I know I'm not doing my job. If the server is coming in and he's got too many inside volleys, you know, it's one thing if they hit it out wide to your, out, to the, out to the alley, he's got the outside volley, that's fine because, you know, the ball's so far away from me. But if he's got that inside volley toward the middle of the line, you know, I'm, I'm just falling asleep at the switch here. So you really want to try to be as aggressive as you can within the space that you can cover. And then, obviously, any time I would go across that midline, you know, Louie would know to switch and then, you know, immediately, you know, cover that part of the court. But, you know, some people get confused when to switch. You know, this would not be a switch situation where I'm just in here, you know, covering my own half of the court. I, I wouldn't expect Louie to switch on that shot. I would kind of cover again here. So, uh, and really the number one job of the, uh, of the server's partner is to get into the head of the receiver. I want really, I want Brock thinking more about what's Gully going to do this time? Is he going to go? Is he going to stay? What's he doing? And if, if I can get in his head a little bit, then, you know, maybe he'll take his eye off the ball. Maybe, you know, he'll try to change his shot in the middle of his swing. So, you know, that's, that's my goal. So to get in his head, I've got to be active. And I learned something great from Fred Stolle, who was a phenomenal doubles player. And Fred always told me, always per poach a couple times in the first game. You know, that kind of sets the tone for the whole match where you're really going to get moving right away and you're just not going to go out there and wait for your partner to do something because it's his serve. So uh, <laughs> that's the deal on the server's partner. And now let's go into some receiving here. Uh, why don't you serve a couple to me, okay? And you take this side, because I can't play the deuce court. I'm over here. Okay, returning serve. All right, uh, first thing is uh, positioning. You know, the nice thing, you know, I'm playing Jonathan here. I know he's got a big serve, so I, I know he's got to get in this box. So basically my mentality is, I've got to defend this, this box right here. And so I look at where he's serving from, and I try to position myself in the middle of, of his possible angles. That's the first thing, getting a good position. A lot of people start out in the wrong position, and then it, it's not going to happen for them. Another thing I like to do is get my outside foot closer to the net post so I'm kind of square to the server. Because if he serves me out wide, you know, I want to fight the angle, so my first step would always be with the near foot and then going across. If you just serve one out wide to me here, a nice little split. And as you can see, I'm loading up on that left leg. So good ready position, it's a nice split. And, you know, I cut the angle off pretty nicely there, and I, I got, it, got the ball nice and early. So we're really looking on the return to number one, get it back. No roses for your opponents. Roses are return of serve errors. When the Bryan Twins won the U.S. Open a couple weeks ago in New York, they got 86% of their returns in play. 
That's a phenomenal percentage. You know, that's kind of old school doubles. You, know, you don't have to hit a winner on the return. If you've got a good partner like Louie, you know, I might be able to hit that low return he can poach. So first things first here, go ahead, anywhere. And we're just going to try to get that ball back. Nice turn. Not a very good return, but uh, you know, we're just trying to get that ball in play. And obviously, if he's coming in, I'm trying to keep it low. One more here, see if we can. That's better. And then, then from there, Louie can go across. So another thing we like to do is return down the line early in the match. So change that return so he hits a kicker up on my forehand here. I might take that, that first ball and go down the line. That's a good thing to do also early in the match. You always want to establish a lot of this stuff early so you get in their head right away. Then another good play is to chip and charge. So serving down the T more to my backhand, I can take that ball and chip. And now we got two people at the net instead of one. So that's a good play. And uh, another kind of unforgotten, you know, kind of forgotten play, the last team on the men's tour that did this really well was the Woodies. You know, they both had nice sliced backhands, and sometimes on a big point, serving my backhand, you know, after they'd established that nice chip and charge, they would just hit that nice little chip lob, and that's a great shot, especially if after you've established something like the chip and charge play. It's, it's good, that's a good variety. So there's four different returns we just hit, and, you know, with the number one theme being, let's, let's make them play. Okay, why don't you hit a couple returns, I'll take the last spot. And then we'll get Jeff in here and we'll, we'll do some uh, good demonstrating. Now, my position now, uh, receiver's partner, um, this is really probably, of the four positions, this is the toughest one to play, I think, because, uh, first of all, you're about 6'5", six, 6'4", six, yeah. You know, I'm very close to a guy 6'4", who's very aggressive. You know, so if, if Louie kind of hits a bad return, I have to dial 911. I'm in a little bit of an emergency situation here. Not that Louis ever would, because I know he returns very well. So my positioning is here, kind of protecting the middle of the court. My first view is, is over to young Brock here, because he's a big threat to me. So I focus on him first. And, and there's a little debate. I know a lot of people go back and forth. You know, some people say, never look back. You know, never look back at your partner when he's receiving. You know, just look over here at Brock, because he's the closest. I don't personally like that. When Tim and I played, I always used to look back. I was playing over here, and I would just glance back to see if basically one thing, if my brother was in good position in relation to the ball or bad position, if he was on balance or off balance. I would glance back, and if he was on balance, I knew he was going to hit a pretty good shot, so then I start thinking offensively, you know. If I, I glance over there and he's like this, he's, he's stretched out and he's going to chip lob or hit a little floater or something, immediately I kind of, you know, as Jim Lair would say, the back end of my brain, my hypothalamus would kick in and I'd get those defensive skills going because I know somebody's going to attack me. So, you know, this is what I call a transition position. Louis makes a good return. I'm on offense. He makes a bad return to Brock's high forehand.